Garden Success is brought to you in part by Martha's Bloomers, offering an expansive collection of plants and tools for the gardener, a boutique store filled with art and home decor, and an award-winning full-service restaurant featuring handcrafted meals and desserts. Martha's Bloomers, located right off Highway 6 in Navasota. Welcome to Garden Success with Stephen Brugerhoff, the show designed to help you have a bountiful garden and a beautiful landscape. Call in now with your lawn and garden questions at 979-845-5689 or email your questions to gardensuccess at tamu.edu. And now, Texas A&M AgriLife Extension horticulturist Stephen Brugerhoff. Well, howdy, friends, and welcome to Garden Success. It turns out today is a beautiful day. Weather is finally cooperating a little bit. At least we have fall for the next two days, and then it's going to jump right back into the 80s. So we're still unseasonably warmer this year. And, of course, we're always looking forward to that, to uh, rain, to a little bit of precipitation, to kind of help bring us back into uh, seasonal normality. Uh, I have um, a request for everyone to go ahead and uh, continue to conserve water and the resources that you have. It helps us all out if you do that. So thank you for doing that on your own dime. And um, of course, thank you for your interest in gardening and garden success. This is a call-in show, 979-845-5689. I'm here for you every Thursday from 12 to 1 o'clock. We're featuring any of your garden successes, as well as some of the challenges you may have gardening here in the Brazos Valley region. Now, over the past week, I've gotten some interesting emails, and I'd like to share at least one with you. Well, two for you, if we have some time. One was a gentleman named Ed. I'll give a shout out to Ed. Hey, Ed, how are you doing? He says he has an olive grower in Tunisia, and he's interested in seedlings that this gentleman has or this uh, producer has, and he wants to know what kind of documentation he needs to export olive seedlings to the United States. Well, that was very interesting to me. It's not often that I get questions like that. And thank you so much, Ed, for offering offering that question so that we can share that with our our, uh, listenership. Uh, So the United States Department of Agriculture does have a process for importation of plants and seeds and there are forms one needs to fill out as well as policy review on the USDA website but if you want to know how to get there um, to get to those resources I would recommend to Ed and to everyone listening to contact the Texas Department of Agriculture so Texas TDA posts regulations and import information from their website Now, having stated this, there's not one single document that TDA does uh, provides uh, specific to this request, but it's best to contact our colleagues at TDA to explore how to do this further, to remain compliant with uh, USDA law, so, or law uh, from the United States. So one can go to their website. It's a mouthful. If if you uh, if you're interested in policies for seed labeling or importation or any regulation uh, any of the uh, regulatory policies from Texas Department of Agriculture in in coordination with the United States Department of Agriculture type into your browser Texas Department of Agriculture regulatory programs from there there's a web page where one can find contact information including an email to explore this further. So again, I thank Ed for pursuing that with me uh, through my career. Uh, I don't get that kind of question often, but when I was in uh, Brazos County, when I was in Brazoria County and Galveston County, those uh, counties have an issue with a disease called citrus greening. So while you can celebrate citrus in those counties, Galveston, Brazoria, Harris County, Fort Bend County, as well as Montgomery County, the laws uh, regulate 
where you can purchase, how you can purchase and move citrus plants um, within those counties. So those counties are quarantined due to this disease called citrus greening. Citrus greening, there's no cure for it, and it does impact uh, it does impact uh, citrus cultivation in the state of Texas. So it's regulated how citrus are moved. So if you're purchasing a, pl a citrus plant in a quarantine county, which you can do, uh, the law states that you cannot move that into a non-quarantined county. So if you purchased a citrus plant, an orange plant, uh, mandarin, orange, lime, a lemon, in say uh, Rosenberg, you're, by law, you're not supposed to export that to another county like Waller County or even Brazos County. So Texas Department of Agriculture is that regulatory authority that is guiding individuals like you and me to do the right thing. And so thank you very much, Ed, for asking that question and providing an opportunity to talk a little bit about that. Well, I wanted to welcome our caller, Barb. How are you doing, Barb? I'm doing good. I just have a really quick question. I bought some broccoli plants. <clears throat> Couldn't get any that looked very good. And they're kind of, oh, I don't know how to explain it. Spindly, I, what I want to do is I want to bury them a little bit, and I'm afraid you're not supposed to do that on broccoli. You know, plant them a little deeper. Mm -hmm. Am I right not to do it, or can I do it? Well, you can get away with maybe about a half an inch or an inch, a little bit slightly deeper, but not, not much more for broccoli. I hear okay. you, they're kind of elongated probably from where they were growing uh, when you purchased them. So, um, you know, I wouldn't plant them too much deeper. They're not going to root along that stem. Uh, they're not like a tomato. They, they won't do that. Right. So just kind right. of monitor them if you think that they're uh, – until they can get some stature to the plant itself, until they can grow their, their um, I don't want to call it a trunk, but their stem a little bit larger, just continue to monitor it. You may even try staking it. You know, if you're afraid that, it's, that the wind is going to snap it, you can take like um, a skewer, a barbecue skewer or a, a chopstick even, and just kind of wrap, uh, wrap that plant up with um, landscaping tape or something, you know, appropriate for outdoors. Okay until it can actually gain okay. a little bit of stature. Okay. I do have one more question. Uh, I was going to transplant my irises, and when I dug them up, they have little holes all on the, on the um, well, that's not a, on the tuber, is that what you call it? Oh, anyway. Okay. And I'm told they're possibly wireworms or weevils. Is there any organic cure or, prote or way to kill that? Or do you think it's something else? Well, that's a really good question. There is this insect, it's called an iris borer. So what this is, is a, is a caterpillar. It's a, it, they, they, they're not a showy moth, right? But um, when the moth itself lays an egg, in the, at the appropriate time of year, and then you get a larvae that starts to burrow into the tuber itself, and so you get these tiny little pinpricks into the, uh, the, um, into that uh, that rooting structure of the, uh, or that stem structure of the iris itself. But as far as um, maintenance or management of it, um, gosh, well, there are insecticides that you can do that but it, it's related to when they're active. So once they're starting to uh, chew through that, they're in a part of the plant that is difficult to get an appropriate um, pesticide down to, you know, an insecticide to. So I'd say, you know, maybe move the uh, plants around a little bit. Um, I'd have to research a little bit further to see what the life cycle of this insect is. Um, you can uh, purchase these um, tiny little insects called, uh, they're little roundworms called beneficial nematodes. They can help. Oh, yeah. That, that's a much longer uh, discussion. So there are methods to kind of avoid that. But some of the methods, I would say, is just to kind of move those plants around. Uh, 
And um, well, won't they take it? It'll take it with them, won't it? Because they're aren't they in the tuber? Well, they may no? have, they may have gone through their life cycle already. Oh, yeah. I mean, that's possible. You won't know until you cut open the tuber, right? Um, or or share it. But it's very likely that the uh, life cycle is already done, and what you're seeing is a result of their activity. Because they didn't bloom this year, the plant, the leaf, or yeah, the above ground, I couldn't, I didn't, couldn't tell anything. There was any problem there, but uh, then when I dug them up to replant them, all of a sudden I noticed it, and I thought, well, I don't want to carry that to, to another part of the garden. I I hear um, you. So yeah. the best time, so from what I remember, the best time to to monitor for them is in springtime or even early summer. Um, but and you're, use you're benefit. Really, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, I'm sorry. And but you're saying use beneficial nematodes in the spring. Um, yes, you can apply them in the in the spring. Um, Okay. Also, also, you're really not going to know until you sample some of those tubers, right? Whether well, not... I've got one, cut it open. I mean, not right this minute, but I yeah. have it. I can cut it open. What should I look for? Um, try to follow uh, a tunneling, you know, through to its end. So if you see a little pin, a pin prick or a little hole in the uh, plant itself, just take a knife yes. and slice it open. And try to follow it down to see if those if those insects are active. But again, it's going to be during a certain time of year, what you, if the uh, tissue that you see is is kind of calloused over, like the hole is there, but it's kind of calloused over and it's not fresh, then they're not active. But you know, you've got a point. No. You're, you're right. Um, those ca you can kill. You can carry the caterpillars with you. You know, if they're um, if they're active, if they're actively in the rhizome itself. So. I'm backtracking here really quickly. <laughs> if there's no activity in the in the iris or in the tuber, then they're already finished. They're no longer in that plant. If you see fresh activity, yes, it is a good idea to go ahead and dispose of that that section, right? But again, you're not going to know uh, their activity really unless you uh, you know seasonally go down and sacrifice one or two of those rhizomes. You know, yeah. just take them and kind of cut them open and see if there's anything, or take one out and kind of look for for um, any kind of damage. Does this happen often for you, or is this the first year that you've noticed it? This is the first time I've noticed it. Okay, well, that's that's my my I recommendation. Of plants, but I saved some of the tubers there to you know in case I needed to show them to somebody or whatever. Yeah. So and and what well okay the so beneficial nematodes don't just go after bad nematodes they they will go after uh, well if this is what I weevils or wireworms or whatever that could be in there the there are spe you bring up a good point uh, beneficial nematodes there are many different species of nematodes or in essence roundworms there are the species that you're looking for are there's two types of nematodes that you'll be looking for when you purchase any um, product that's commercially sold there will be specific information on that so it's got a long name to them but you're looking for uh, species that are either heterohabditis I can't say that right <laughs> or Steiner Steiner Nema if you I tell you what if you send me an email at gardensuccess at tamu.edu, I can give you specific information uh, for, for okay. applying them. So it's a little bit deeper discussion talking about beneficial nematodes. You're right. There are species that you're, specific species that will do the job more effectively. You can't just go out and buy any uh, beneficial nematode. Um, the uh, packaging on the uh, product itself will tell you what kind of um, nematode is in that, you know, in that product. And so there are specific ones that have a really long name. It's almost like saying the word Brugerhoff and trying to spell that out. Um, but I can do that a little bit more effectively and successfully if you send me an email at gardensuccess at tamu.edu. Okay. All right. Thank so, you so much. Oh, yeah, sure. And, and all is not lost. I know it's a little disconcerting. 
you know, a few holes in a couple of plants is not a big deal, but, um, you know, you don't want the populations to build up either. Thanks. Sure. And thank you so much, Barb, for calling. It's always a, a new day, and I'm really glad that Barb asked that question. Um, there are specific insects for ornamental plants, some like the iris borer, which you may or may not find in your uh, plants. When I was down on the Gulf Coast, we couldn't grow um, bearded iris. So living across the state, my wife and I were in around the Austin area for a while in Round Rock, Texas, and we could successfully grow uh, bearded iris as well as uh, daylilies. But moving to the coast, different climate, different environment, we really couldn't uh, work successfully with bearded iris. I did bring some with me. Unfortunately, they just didn't perform as well as they had in Central Texas. So I'm glad I'm back in College Station that I have an opportunity to grow bearded iris. And certainly I'll be looking out for iris borers, just like Barb is as well. Well, thanks so much again, Barb, for calling in at 979-845-5689. Well, I received another email from a person named Marion. Marion had some, uh, a, but she has some dieback on a holly shrub that she has around her house. Now, I'm, I'm suspecting that she has several as a hedge, and her issue was that the leaves on the uh, branches of the holly were drying and dying. And for, you know, for, from her experience, it appeared that this was a phenomena that was happening pretty quickly, you know. So about a month ago, she started noticing that some of the leaves started uh, drying up on the plant, and then they successfully started dying back. And she asked, is there a disease specific to these plants? You know, is this what's going on? Well, my, uh, I could only look at the uh, images that she sent to me, and thanks again. Marion, for sending on those images. Um, my response to Marion, you know, is related to what I see in the picture. So if y'all have any, um, any issue with your landscaping, you can send it to gardensuccess at tamu.edu, and we'll give, it a, we'll give it a go over. If you do send pictures, pictures say a thousand words, but just make sure that they're clear and they're right on point for uh, what we're discussing. And, of course, Marion gave me some great uh, pictures, but it didn't really tell the whole story, so I kind of had to give her a more, rounded e a, a more rounded response to her email. So for these plants, they could be succumbing to several environmental factors that can contribute to the decline of the holly, which includes overwatering, in other words, soil saturation. Here in in this area and college stations surrounding areas, we have a challenge with uh, hard pan clay underneath, you know, the subsoil as part of the so the soil profile. That in itself can you can you can have pockets of water that doesn't completely penetrate the entire soil profile. You can have standing water, and unfortunately, if you're watering too much, uh, it causes the soil to become oversaturated, and that can lead to a decline of some of these plants, like the holly. Or, for hollies in general, if they go through a period where they don't get any water, right? If there's no water, then they can succumb to that as well. And oftentimes we associate that with some of these dry spells that we've had recently. You know, 2023 drought was really hard on our landscaping plants. And this late summer, we're currently in a drought uh, under drought conditions, we're not under extreme drought, but certainly we have to watch how we water and what we water and make sure that we do get water to the plants that we're cultivating. So it just kind of coincided with this hot and dry spell that we recently received. So what's going on? The dieback is a result of compromised vascular tissue. What that means is water is not cruising up and down that the vascular tissue of the plant. And it could be from, you know, lack of water, uh, no water around the plants themselves. Water's not cruising through the plant. The plant responds. Cells start dying. You'll see it uh, on the leaves first. And then sometimes if it goes on too long, 
branches will start dying back as well. It also could be a fungal um, issue. You know, if the plant is uh, if the plant is exposed to and and starts reacting to Phytophthora root rot, which is a fungal pathogen, and hollies are susceptible to that as well as several other landscaping plants, it basically, and in general terms, basically what it's doing is is plugging up the pipes, right? Um, the vascular tissue is compromised, and it's not sending those um, that resource to the plant throughout the plant itself, and then the plant starts to respond and dies from that. So I suggested to her that she do several things. One, she can check on the layer of mulch underneath the plant. So one is to check its watering. Maybe she has uh, an irrigation system that's on automatic, like a lawn sprinkler system or even drip irrigation through her landscaping. It may be malfunctioning and the plant itself or the, you know, the, several of those plants are not getting any water, which is an issue, right? Plants don't get water, they start to die. Even woody plants, like hollies, they have a, they have a tipping point. So, I asked her to go ahead and check on the mulch underneath the plant itself for several reasons. If she has uh, mulch that has become compacted, you know, you laid down mulch last year, you think everything's just fine. Maybe it's a shredded mulch that you put down last year. You don't get um, enough water to the plant at just the right time. Um, over about a year's time, the shredded mulch itself starts to interlock its fibers and becomes, uh, it kind of sheds water. So maybe you're surface watering, but the water is not effectively penetrating that mulch that has now become compacted, and that's an issue. So I asked her, go ahead and check the mulch make sure it's not compacted around the plants itself. If it is and it's up and hugging the, the uh, trunks of the plants, that could be an issue as well. So go ahead and pull back the mulch that she has just to provide uh, a space for water to get into when she's watering your plants. Um, that's one thing I asked her to do. Now I also told her to check the uh, leaves, uh, let me know if there's anything that is kind of discolored. If the leaves are discolored, say they've got a, a halo uh, spotting with halo on it or other signs of a fungal pathogen to report that to me as well. One way that I suggested for her to check for Phytophthora root rot is to go ahead and sacrifice a branch. Find a branch, whether it's living or dead, cut it off, and then kind of cut it in half. Expose that vascular tissue if there's a black streaking through it, that's one indication that she has Phytophthora root rot. Now, if she does have Phytophthora root rot, there is not much that she can do for that other than just continue to cultivate the plant, um, maybe cut it, if she can, cut it below the, um, the tissue that's you know, expressing some of those symptoms just to try to get ahead of that. You know, Maybe it's more isolated. If it's coming from the roots, it probably isn't. But anyway, if she does have Phytophthora root rot, there are, there are signs that she can look for to, you know, take it a little bit further. We can examine it a little bit further. Um, also, I, I asked her, you know, for viable branches, let's say some of the leaves have dropped off, but all is not lost. The plant is still alive. To go ahead and just simply take her fingernail scratch some of the bark and look for any living green tissue. At least, you know, finding out if you got viable tissue on those shrubs will give you some hope that the plant will come back and respond after watering. After offering that advice to Marion, she responded. She, for one, she uh, enjoys the show and she really does, uh, is a supporter of garden success. So thank you very much, Marion for uh, being a supporter and listening to our program as well. Uh, she checked around and sure enough, the irrigation system that she has wasn't getting water to the plants. And so they were just reacting to a dry environment. They were bone dry in her words. So she's adjusting her watering and uh, cultivating it. She also did the little scratch test on the plants themselves and she's encouraged, I'm encouraged that she told me that there's still green living tissue on those shrubs. So. Thank you very much, Marion, for that opportunity to work this out with you. 
I do appreciate the images that you sent. I couldn't really tell the whole picture, but offering that advice to you, you were able to self, um, you were able to explore this yourself and see if they're, you know, kind of dig down a little bit further and see what the issue might be so we could help you resolve this. It's stories like this from Marion that I really do appreciate. It provides us an opportunity to help out our residents to improve our gardening skills and also get at the root of what may be uh, challenging in the landscape. Well, we've got some upcoming programs I wanted to discuss with you. You know, October, I mentioned this last week, I think I mentioned that October is almost like our second spring, right? There's a lot of gardening activity. There's a lot of activity about regarding getting outdoors, just getting outdoors. You know, once it gets cooler like it is today, it really encourages us to get out and explore natural areas. Let's say if you've got a, a an opportunity to go share some of the programs that are going out at Lick Creek Park and that are sponsored by the college by the city of College Station. They've got some great activities out there, including a trunk or treat program. I think that's going to be not tomorrow, but the following Friday. I believe that's October the 25th. It's a family program. They're asking our residents to come out in the evening and explore uh, natural areas and celebrate um, Halloween in a fun and friendly environment and focus on trees. So just check out uh, the City of College Station's website to see when the event is and uh, what time and just bring your kiddos on out. I think they'd really appreciate that. Speaking of, <clears throat> excuse me, speaking of Saturday, we are offering our Brazos County Master Gardeners, along with the uh, collaboration with the Texas A&M Forest Service, are offering an event called Trees for Brazos County. That's going to be October the 26th. So you've got about a week and a couple of days to register for this no admission program. We're not charging to get you in the door, but we'll be celebrating and offering seminars on tree care. That's October the 26th. It's from nine to noon. And I'll be giving a presentation on how to plant a tree properly. We have colleagues, uh, Morgan Abbott and uh, Mr. Campos, who will be giving talks about tree care, the right kind of trees that you can put in your landscape. The bonus will also be giving away tree saplings as well. So if you could join us, we'll be at our extension office in Bryan on October the 26th. No admission, but we're asking people to register we know who, we, we got to know who's coming to the party. We've got some samplings to give away, but we have a limited amount. So uh, don't forget to sign up because we'd love to have you out there for that event. Other things that are going on, of course, Brazos Valley Fair and Rodeo. Our Brazos County Master Gardeners will be exhibiting along with the 4-H in, uh, in the Aggieland portion of the uh, Brazos Valley Fair and Rodeo. Of course, you know that's October the 18th through the 20th. We'll be We'll be through, out there through the marathon, right, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. And we'd love to have you stop by the booth and talk to us a little bit because we'll be promoting a Texas Master Gardener training. If you're interested in becoming a Texas Master Gardener, I'm offering some uh, no-admission uh, information sessions, and that's going to be October the 30th at our, at our extension office, and that's from 5.30 to 6.30 as well as repeating on November the 6th, and that's going to be an afternoon program. Come to either one of those if you're interested in becoming a Texas Master Gardener. We're going to start our training program in January, and we select, you know, about 20 to 25 people. So it is competitive, but we do appreciate our volunteers that are helping us to explore best practices in gardening in our community. Go to our Master Gardeners website, txmg.org forward slash Brazos, to find out more information about those two programs, the tree program, as well as the open house for training, and other programs that we're offering from our website. Well, folks, we've got some other, we've got an opportunity for y'all to call in, of course. We've got about another 30 minutes to spend with you, and I really enjoy spending my time with you. Feel free to call in at 979-845-5689. Of 
now I received another email from Dan, and this one's about turf. In my trade, you know, we kind of jokingly refer to a lot of the questions. The, ma the majority of the questions that we get are either about turf, trees, and tomatoes. Seems to be, <laughs> seems to be what's on everybody's mind seasonally. And we know that right now is a good time to be thinking about trees appropriate for your landscape and, you know, to plant them out as well. So, but for turf, his question is he's got a zoysia lawn and he's been fighting with a particular weed. So he did send in a picture, clear as a, clear as a bell, and I responded to him. And this is a, what I saw was a weedy species we commonly call Virginia buttonweed. For those of you in, in uh, landscaping, right about now, you know, Virginia buttonweed is a constant companion in the lawn, unfortunately. And then, you know, right about now, there's also another species that's a native plant and it's beautiful, but it's a low growing fall aster. I had another gentleman send me, uh, he called me up and asked, you know, what can I do about this fall aster? And so I need to call him back and just give him some advice on, on how to deal with that. Now, the challenge with Virginia buttonweed is it's a tenacious species and it can be difficult to control once it's in the landscape. Unfortunately, it has all the characteristics of a hardy invasive species. It grows low to the ground, which makes it, you know, controlled uh, via mowing difficult. Same thing with the, that fall aster, that, that really, really low growing fall aster. For Virginia buttonweed, it propagates by rooting from its stems. It does have a flowering, a period of flowering, and it can also propagate itself by seed. So as far as Dan's purpose, he's currently practicing um, mowing it to know, you know, that didn't provide him with many uh, results for that. He is vigilant and he's been removing it by hand. We call it mechanical removal, right? Getting out and hand pulling or cultivating with a hoe. But unfortunately, you know, he still has it in, in the yard. Now, herbicide may be his best option for managing this. Typically, Virginia buttonweed is kind of, it's a little sneaky, right? Sometimes you'll see a large patch of it in your yard, which means you can effectively deal with it or spot spray it, right? But, if it, but it also kind of cruises throughout the lawn environment as well. So it can be a little challenging getting it out of, out of the lawn if it's growing amongst uh, other grasses that you have, especially if it's under St. Augustine grass. Here in, in um, College Station in Bryan, the grass of uh, the predominant grass in lawns is Bermuda grass, a little bit more forgiving with the herbicide application. But if you've got St. August, St. Augustine grass, it's uh, a sensitive child. It's very, very sensitive to most uh, herbicides that you can successfully use on, on Bermuda grass, but not so much on St. Augustine grass. So what I mentioned to Dan is if he's got a larger patch of it, something that he can actively you know, apply an herbicide spray over it. Uh, you can use uh, products containing glyphosate, and there's different brand name products containing glyphosate. We know them like names like Roundup Weed or Grass Killer, Ranger, Pro Herbicide, Clean Up Weed. Anyway, there's a number, number of brand names that contain that active ingredient. And I'm offering to you, dear listener, to focus on the active ingredient, right? I know we're all brand sensitive or maybe brand loyal, but um, it's always best to read the product that you have, understand the active ingredient, and learn a little bit more about how the plants react to that active ingredient. So with a non-selective um, herbicide containing glyphosate, uh, you have to be careful with their application because again, it's, it's non-selective. It's a contact herbicide. The mode of action is absorption across the vegetation and it's translocated system, system, systemically, blocks the synthesis of proteins, and in turn, it desiccates the plant. So the plant, uh, plant cells start to, uh, start to collapse. So, um, you know, we, you, certainly he could approach it that way if the, uh, there's enough of it to uh, actively uh, apply an herbicide to. 
so again, because it's non-selective, he's going to have to be very careful in how he applies that so he doesn't have um, what I call micro-drift, right? A little bit of that product. It's applied, in, you know, foliarly in liquid form. Um, sometimes a little bit of that mist can get onto other plants and it'll start to affect the other plants as well. It might take them out. So make sure that you're applying a product like that early in the morning when there's very little to no wind. It's always best to do this in the morning, first thing in the morning. Um, also make sure that you're avoiding any kind of rain events so that the uh, um, material itself can have good contact and won't effectively get washed off of the plant you're applying that to. So a little bit of common sense will help you be successful applying an herbicide like that. You can also do this late in the evening, um, but again, just be very vigilant how you're applying that kind of a product. Now, um, there are herbicides that are formulated with a combination of a few more active ingredients. So I addressed it through glyphosate, which is a contact herbicide. There are others that contain 2,4-D, carfentrazone, dicamba, Mecoprop P, these are combinations that can be spot applied over warm season grasses like zoysia grass. So the product that he currently was using was rated for use over zoysia grass. So again, he's trying to eliminate um, he's trying to eliminate buttonweed, Virginia buttonweed in his lawn. Fortunately, he's got a type of grass and a combination of, of active ingredients in a product that's appropriate for use over zoysia grass. Um, and um, Virginia buttonweed is identified as a broadleaf weed species, and it is listed on the product that he mentioned to me. So for him, uh, he's going to have to apply this um, in intervals, right? Spot application uh, for that particular plant he's trying to eliminate, and he's going to have to repeat that application as well. The surrounding grass may yellow a little bit with a repeat application, but at least it won't kill it out. So what, is, what turns out to be uh, maybe a simpler answer is a little bit more complicated in try and with additional action that he can take to try to eliminate the Virginia buttonweed. There's not a one-stop shopping answer for that, um, but there are several different methods that he can use and apply to that to try to get rid of the problem that he has in his lawn for the weed. So, um, Dan, I wish you all the best on that and uh, just a little bit of vigilance and some more activity on your part will help you get rid of the problem. Now, I have another, uh, had another email uh, on that um, note. I had another email from a person named Susan Susan wrote in, she's got some, what looks to me like some sort of an elm tree that she's tried to cultivate or cut out of her landscaping, but she's having very little success doing that. There are elm species that you can try to, you know, even if they're a tiny little sapling coming in your landscape, let's say you missed it when, when they first germinated and um, were about two inches off the ground and, you know, you're cruising about your day and you come back to your landscape on a weekend, for, you know, months down the road, and now you've got a finger length, a uh, finger width uh, sapling that's growing up in your landscape. She tried to cultivate that out, tried to cut it, and unfortunately it resprouted again. So she's having a little bit of difficulty with woody species in her landscaping, and her question was, how does she effectively get rid of something like that? So it's kind of related to Virginia buttonweed in a way. It's just different uh, vegetative matter we're talking about. So again, instead of herbaceous material like a weedy grass or a broadleaf species, she's actually working to control a woody plant in the landscape. Well, it's another one of those, it depends, <laughs> answers. And um, also, there are several different methods that she can use to uh, address that and try to get rid of the, the um, woody species. So thank you so much for sending that in. Susan. Um, herbicides are one method of getting rid of it, and there's different types of applications she can apply to that. So Susan, 
Uh, if the plant itself has some leaves present on it and the pictures you sent are amazing, thank you very much for that. Um, fortunately, it's not very tall, but again, she's trying to get rid of something that re-sprouts and kind of uh, maneuvers around her activity of just cutting it out and it's coming right back again. So Susan, if it's got some foliage on it, you can apply an herbicide to the uh, try a foliar application for that. Um, spot treat it uh, with a foliar application of an herbicide rated for use for um, woody uh, plant management or elimination. So you can try that. Uh, another thing that you can do, Susan, is to apply a basal application. So what that means is you're applying uh, an herbicide, and usually that's an herbicide with and mixed with an oil right, that helps penetrate through the uh, woody tissue itself. You can apply that at the base of the plant itself, but it, you may not have a lot of success with that. What I've found most successful is what I call the cut stump method. Now, the, uh, the, that little sapling that you've got in your landscape, it looks big enough that you have enough surface area to work with. So cut stump is exactly like what it sounds like. What you're doing is you're cutting the plant right, right really close to the ground. You're exposing tissue. You've got fresh tissue now. Um, you've cut it maybe about an inch or two above the uh, ground. You now have fresh tissue that you can apply an herbicide. You can literally just paint it on to that wound. The plant will accept it, and it'll the uh, herbicide will cruise through the vascular tissue, and hopefully, if you've done this right, eliminate that plant. It'll take a little bit of time but the plant may uh, react. And I say may because it depends on how you're applying it. But that's what I've found to be the most effective for stumps, you know, whether it's a larger circumference um, trunk, maybe about three inches in diameter, or in your case, um, you've got one that looks like it's about an inch in diameter. You should be successful doing that. So again, you'll uh, have to get an herbicide that's rated for use for woody plant control. Oftentimes, you'll see a glyphosate type product, an active ingredient containing glyphosate, along with another uh, herbicide, uh, another, um, another product or another active ingredient that's mixed in with that appropriate for woody plant removal. Um, sometimes it's, it's sold as like poison ivy control, you know, just look a little carefully on the uh, shelf of the uh, home improvement store, find a product rated for getting rid of Woody, uh, woody plants like poison ivy, and you'll be successful. So again, you cut it close to the ground. You take the product, of course, wear gloves, carefully paint it onto that surface, making sure it's clear of any sawdust. If you're using hand pruners and it's small enough, you're not going to have residual sawdust on there. The point is just making sure it's clean and clear so that you can go ahead and paint that living tissue. Uh, you can put it around the edges of the uh, stump itself. If you've got a larger stump, maybe about three or four inches in diameter, the, the vascular tissue is right underneath the bark. So in your case, Susan, I'd say just paint the entire surface. You should be good to go. Um, so uh, thanks again, Susan, for sending in that, that email and asking that question. It's always good. Uh, good to know that you can take action for some of these plants that have become a little aggressive in the landscape. Now there's several different trees that unfortunately they do provide seeds. You know, they may look great in the landscape, but they can seem to be aggressive and cutting loose in your landscape as well. Uh, one thing that I'd uh, recommend to do is get to know the kind of trees that are appropriate for planting in your landscape. In Susan's case, I suspect it was, um, it kind of looked like an elm. It might be um, a lace bark elm. It may, might be a, uh, another different species of elm, not a, not a native species that's just, you know, the conditions are just right for the seeds to germinate. Now you've got them throughout your landscape. Uh, it's always best to investigate uh, plants that are appropriate for our landscape, they're not as aggressive um, as, you know, we might experience. So uh, there are quite a number of native plants, native woody species that are great for using in our landscape here. If you come to our program on October the 26th from 9 to noon, we'd love to share that information with you and 
guide you to a species that will work great for you, look great in the landscape, and provide a wonderful service for us as well. Well, I'd like to welcome David to the show. Hi, David. How are you doing? Doing okay. Excellent. How can what can we, we do for a, you? Well, uh, my wife and I are frequent bike riders to the Leech Gardens at A M, and uh, there was a sign there about fall festival. It is supposed to be Saturday. Then the sign seemed to disappear. I also read about it on uh, it's the Texas Seeds, which you, know, the, you probably know about that little newsletter from Texas Gardener Magazine. Anyway, I was just wondering if maybe it got canceled because you didn't mention it uh, on the events. Uh, at least I didn't hear you mention it. So is that still going on? Is for, or do you know about it? Oh, yes, sir. I'm glad you brought it up. And yep, I, I did miss that one. That's a big deal. This is a family event that's happening on Texas A&M campus at the uh, Leach Teaching Gardens or the gardens at Texas A&M University. Um, it's near the uh, administrative buildings for some of those of y'all who haven't been there before. Great family event is happening from 9 a.m. to 11.30 a.m. They have uh, different activities from different organizations uh, just celebrating our community and our gardening experience um, through the gardens, beautiful gardens. If you walk through them, they're, they're excellent. But we do have great partners that are uh, that will be out there at the gardens and our Brazos County Master Gardeners will be out there with a booth helping families make seed balls that they can take home and start their own wildflower garden. So I'm glad you mentioned it. Uh, yeah, it's a great event yeah. and, I, well, and I really do um, regard it highly. Well, I, I'm, I'm glad I called you then because I was thinking, well, uh, the sign's gone. You didn't mention it. Probably got canceled for some reason. So oh, no. I, it's, I guess not. So. <laughs> okay. It's not canceled. Yeah, it's... <laughs> It's a big deal. All right, We're good really deal. Well, they, they do have, yeah, and the web, uh, the little thing on the website. There's a little, there's a website on it too that you can look at. But it is free parking out there. Uh, they have normally, it's parking is a real issue, but uh, they, they're supposed to be free parking there in the adjacent uh, big lots that are near there. So, uh, in case somebody's worried about that, that's that's supposed to be not a problem. So, anyway, well, thank you. Enjoy your show. Yeah, and thank you so much for calling in, David. Yeah, we've got some great uh, programs that are going on around town. We're, we're very, very active. Our Brazos County Master Gardeners, of course. We've got a program at the Munts Library this coming Saturday as well. Um, this one is going to be about garden resolutions. And typically at the Munts Library, they're out there at 10 o'clock, 10 to 11 o'clock, and one of our Master Gardeners is there to give some suggestions of, of how you can plan your gardening experience for tw late 2024 and 2025. Gardening is an intentional activity, right? If you're putting in your landscape, um, always think about what you're doing. Now, I, you know, some of us um, just do it just for the sheer fun, and that's an intention. Maybe you're growing plants like vegetables, you're growing them, and you're willing to share them with the local uh, food bank or uh, an organization with uh, uh re with residents in need certainly that's an intention as well or maybe you're gardening for pollinators i always ask you to think about uh, what you're going to be doing that'll help you be more successful to reach the goal of gardening so join our master gardeners at the month's library this coming saturday from 10 to 11. no admission just come on out they'd love to have you don't forget about the leech teaching gardens having a great fall festival celebrating our uh, gardening experience with families. Great uh, event is from 9 to 11.30 out on campus at the gardens at Texas A&M University. Beautiful gardens if you've never been there before. It's an opportunity for you to go and explore with no admission. But like uh, David pointed out, they do offer free parking on the weekends for that event. Just come on down, put it in your... your um, search engine and come on down to the uh, program you know the brazos valley fair our brazos county master gardeners have a booth there as well and we're going to be out there for the entire event from friday through sunday but we would uh, love for y'all to stop on by if you're join enjoying the fair and rodeo to stop on by our booth we're right next to where the uh, 4-h uh, tents are and uh, we'll be offering gardening advice as well as an opportunity for people to 
take their pictures at a little photo booth we've set up out there. So a lot of a lot of things happening this coming Saturday. I'm really looking forward to being out there. I'll be out at the uh, the fair. I'll stop on by the uh, Leech Teaching Gardens for the family event for a little bit. Um, we're here to help you all be successful in your gardening adventures <laughs> and your intentional gardening as well. Well, we've had a couple more emails that have come through um, over the past week. One of them was related to mealybugs, but I think I'm running out of time, so I really won't have enough time to really talk about that. Oh, I do have this one a person who wrote in, and uh, she sent a picture as well. It's, uh, she's got a gardenia out in her garden, and the gardenia is looking a little pale from the picture that I saw. She's a little worried about it, uh, yellowing leaves. Uh, she also has some citrus uh, out there, but I'll focus on the gardenia. Uh, gardenia, unfortunately, they react to... There, you can garden successfully with gardenia for a little while, but gardenia prefer a little uh, soil that's a little bit more acidic than we have here in our county. So if you've got them in the ground, uh, they may show a little bit of chlorosis, a nutritional deficiency. And one way to compensate for that, of course, is applying a fertilizer at the right time of year, you know, to, conti to continue to give the plants what they need. So while our, our soil type is just a little bit more alkaline than they prefer, you can compensate for that through a series of, uh, you know, appropriate fertilization at the right time of year. There also might be some iron chlorosis, but what, what I can see is more of a, a nitrogen deficiency in the pictures that I saw. So I thank, I thank our, our resident for writing in. Thanks again, Mary, for sending that in. And I promise I will send a response to this email as well. Well, folks, we're winding up towards the end of the hour. I thank you all so much for joining us for Garden Success. We still have a couple more minutes. If you'd like to call in, I'd certainly love to talk to you at 979-845-5689. You can also send in inquiries to our email address, which is gardensuccess at tamu.edu. We're here weekly from 12 to 1, and there's quite a bit that we can explore and share together regarding our gardening experience. Now, my backyard, backyard's looking great right now. I've got that little fall aster I was talking about earlier. You know, it, it is considered to be a weedy species, but I'm kind of enjoying the tiny little purple daisy-like flowers that are coming up. There's another fall aster, different, same genera, genus, different species, that we cultivate in our gardens. This one's taller and um, kind of a shrubby plant. It just sits in the landscape most of the year, but right about now, per its name, it starts to put up these beautiful little purplish daisy flowers. They're about less than an inch in diameter, but they just look fabulous. And mine is really showing off right now. I've got great contrast with that and a um, salvia behind it that's got some white flowers on it. Peppers, my peppers are coming in like gangbusters. I have this one variety called Mucho Nacho. Now, I may have talked about this last week, so please forgive me, but my peppers are coming on like gangbusters right now. I can't keep up with them, so I'm starting to pickle them. Uh, I love pickled peppers. <laughs> I love to say pickled peppers as well, but uh, Mucho Nacho is a really robust varietal. Um, kind of looks like almost it almost has a characteristic like a tiny little bell pepper right it's not rounded like a bell pepper it's still kind of elongate like a jalapeno is supposed to look like but it's pretty robust and it is spicy there's also another varietal that one of my Brazos County Master Gardeners had grown out I believe it's Diane I may have gotten your name wrong, Diane, but I think it's Diane, brought in a, a sack of them to a volunteer work day that we had out at our demonstration garden. And these were a variety, I believe they were developed by uh, Texas A&M in some of their research trials. This is several years uh, old as far as the hybrid that's been released, but this one has no heat to it. So you get the wonderful taste of jalapeno if you're sensitive to the, uh, to the, uh, to the spices that accompany those plants. This one has no heat to it at all. I think the name of it is Fooled You. 
<laughs> it's possible. Right now, it's too late to be planting up peppers. You're just going to have to enjoy the, the harvest of your labors uh, that you've been cultivating these plants for the past several months. And certainly, I'm doing that, and it's great to be able to share some of our vegetables with you. So folks, if you're growing up vegetables, a fall garden, maybe you're preparing a fall garden, and I think next week I'll talk about a little bit about what kind of plants you can work with as far as successfully gardening um, a successful fall and winter garden. You know, a lot of them are going to be crucifers, carrots. There's other plants that I can mention, but I think I'll wait. I'll save that for next week. But for now, again, we've got an abundance of harvest, and I'm sharing that with our friends. Our Brazos County Master Gardeners are sharing their produce as well, not only amongst us friends, but they also have, we also have, a demonstration garden off of Highway 21. We have a couple of beds that we devote to cultivation and then donating the, the harvest to some local charitable organizations. We know that there are f friends and family in need, and certainly we're part of that uh, process as well. So we're trying to do the best we can to show our community how best, best practices in gardening through exhibition at some of these events that we're at, through actively being out at our demonstration garden off of Highway 21. We affectionately call it the DIG, Demonstration Idea Garden. We're out there on a monthly uh, cultivating that garden, and we do welcome the public to programs that we're hosting out there. You'll just have to catch up with us. Go to our website at txmg.org forward slash Brazos. Well, I thank you all once again for listening to the program and sharing your stories and calling in uh, on a weekly basis. I also want to thank Martha's Bloomers as an underwriter for the program. Martha's Bloomers out in, um, out in Navasota, great uh, retail outlet, um, certainly They've got some events and things going on out there, so thank you again to Martha's Bloomers as an underwriter. Thank you for your support of this program. Also, thanks to our Brazos County Master Gardeners Association, a great group of volunteers that are helping to promote best practices in gardening and promote the extension mission. We're making a difference in your lives, and we're doing that through programs sponsored by KAMU, uh, for this program. So thank you to our uh, host, uh, KAMU, for sponsoring Garden Success so that we can continue to make a positive difference in our shared experience of gardening. If you aren't outside, you should get outside. I'm not telling you to skip work. I'm just saying, you know, maybe if you've got time, just get out and explore it. My wife and I went out the other night to look, look at the comet we actually got to see a little smudge <laughs> on the horizon. <laughs> we went out into uh, some natural areas, and um, we actually got to see it. We've got a great harvest moon coming up this weekend. But even during the early evening or even afternoon, if you've got a chance, just get outside. We'd love to see you and help you explore your best practices in gardening. I'm Stephen Brugerhoff, horticulture agent serving Brazos County. Thank you very much for your support, and we'll see you in the garden. You've been listening to Garden Success with Texas A&M AgriLife Extension horticulturist Stephen Brugerhoff. Join us again next week as Stephen discusses your questions about gardening and landscaping in the Brazos Valley. Garden Success is brought to you in part by Martha's Bloomers, offering an expansive collection of plants and tools for the gardener, a boutique store filled with art and home decor, and an award-winning full-service restaurant featuring handcrafted meals and desserts. Martha's Bloomers, located right off Highway 6 in Navasota.